Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Near the end of his treatise on the anger of God in chapter 21, Lactantius is going to grapple with some objections that will inevitably be raised by some of his fellow Christians having to do with God being angry. How can it be okay for God to be angry when God has given Christians precepts, praekepta, teachings about anger, namely that they're not supposed to be angry. And so he frames this as the question, someone will perhaps say, God is so far from being angry that in his precepts, he even forbids human beings to be angry. So the, the general idea here is that God would not command for human beings something that God himself, itself, whatever God is, would be engaging in because that would be a kind of, you know, contradiction or hypocrisy. And, you know, what verses or what teachings, what praecepta does Lactantius have in mind? Well, those found in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly in Matthew chapter 5, where there's a very clear teaching with three sort of, uh, you could say, uh, increasing penalties for acts of anger. This is something that many Christian theologians have focused in on. And then, of course, we have Ephesians, where Paul says, you know, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the, the sun go down on your anger. Try to avoid anger, malice, bitterness, all these sorts of things. So it seems like, at least in Scripture, God is telling people, you really shouldn't be angry. And the way that Lactantius is going to approach this is by both differentiating between the anger that God feels and is moved by and the anger that human beings feel and are moved by. And he's going to say that God doesn't actually rule out all anger for human beings. He rules out the kinds of anger or the ways of following and expressing anger that are inherently problematic. And so, you know, he tells us first that human anger, and he uses several different uh, terms here, needs to be curbed, uh, refrenanda. So, you know, sort of like restrained, pulled in, braked, you could say. It also needs to be moderated, temporary. So it's not getting rid of anger completely. It's keeping it within certain um, limits, you could say, within certain boundaries. A little bit later on, he'll tell us that, um, you know, anger is not to be uh, torn up by the roots, but rather restrained and corrected, right? So why? Well, because there's some really important differences between human anger and divine anger. So the first thing is that humans often get angry as he says, unjustly for wrong reasons. He's talked about this earlier in the piece. Uh, anger can be uh, part of virtue, but it can also be part of vice for human beings. And there's a lot of ways in which our anger goes wrong. You know, he, he knows uh, the things that, say, the Aristotelians and the Stoics and the Epicureans have said about human anger. And he acknowledges that insofar as they're describing unjust anger, they're, they're actually correct, right? They're correct in not seeing that in God. So he says that um, because these things, uh, you know, uh, 
should be uh, done, which the low and those of moderate station and great kings do in their anger. Uh, his rage ought to have been moderated and suppressed. Um, you know, lest being out of his mind, he should commit some inexpiable crime, some crime that can't be remedied. That's, that's us human beings. So, you know, it's not just the high, it's also the, the low. But God is never angry, like he says, unless deservedly. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a moot point. God doesn't have to rule out unjust anger for God because he doesn't even do it for human beings. Another key thing is that human anger, and here's a very interesting thing to point out. Human anger is, as we can translate it, an immediate emotion, praesentum. So something that happens right away. And he actually uses this term twice throughout this chapter. It's something that uh, we feel, and then we're immediately directed towards it. As you know, other people have pointed out, there's a certain urgency towards anger. And it's also a temporary, temporale, and again, he uses this word twice in this, emotion. We can't take anger as being a great guide for us because it, it doesn't last all that long. Actually, when it does last too long, it's also... A problem as he's going to say. So, you know, this is the case for us. Uh, it's not going to be the case for God, however, whose anger is, as uh, Lactantius is going to say, in a certain way, eternal. And we'll, we'll come to that in just a bit. So there's some important differences here. And if that's not convincing enough, he's going to provide some other arguments as well. So one of these is that, and this is quite ingenious, God would be uh, condemning, criticizing, censoring, reprehensor. He'd be a, a critic of his own creation if he happened to prohibit anger altogether in human beings, right? Because human beings are, in fact, like everything else, according to Lactantius, created by God. So this you know, raises the issue of, of evil. Is God responsible for evil? That has been addressed a little bit earlier. Is God doing the wrong thing by making it possible for human beings to feel anger? And specifically, now here we get to some ancient medical ideas that we have, you know, we don't, we don't buy into anymore. They've been dismissed. He says, um, he, from the beginning, inserted anger into the liver of human beings because it's believed that the cause of this emotion is contained in the moisture of the gall. So this is dependent upon the theory of humors, which we don't accept anymore. But we could just as well you know, change this to say, well, why did God give us brains that are subject to anger? Why did he give us systems that like can, you know, send cortisol and adrenaline through our, our bodily system? And it would be the same question. So, you know, he's saying that if God prohibited anger, he would actually be condemning his own work. That doesn't make sense. So he can't be simply ruling out all anger with these precepts, which is the way that some Christians have interpreted them. So he says, well, let's think about what God is actually commanding in the precepts. So the first thing is that we shouldn't be persevering in anger, in ira permanare, to stay for a extended duration in our anger. And why not? Well, Lactantius says things similar to what other Christians point out and also other, uh, you know, pre-Christian philosophers, like, for example, Aristotle. When we remain in anger, there is a tendency for that anger to turn into something worse than anger, which is hatred, treating people as enemies, inimicitia. So that is a significant problem. And that's why we shouldn't be in, you know, like remaining in anger forever, holding grudges, you know, that sort of thing. And he says the anger of mortals ought to be mortal, right? And then he also says when he enjoined us to be angry and yet not to sin, right? What does that mean? 
We are not tearing up anger by its roots, but restraining it so that we might preserve two important things, which are actually ruling that anger, moderation, and even more importantly, justice. Lactantius thinks that there are some cases where we probably should be angry, but we need to remain within certain boundaries that are imposed by moderation and justice, two of the cardinal virtues, right? He also tells us that as human beings, and this is what the precepts are requiring of us, particularly that in, you know, Matthew 5, where if you have a beef with your brother, you're not supposed to bring your gift to the altar quite yet. Just leave it there and be reconciled and then come back. Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So we should be appeased. And notice that he uses this term placari, right? He doesn't say parkare, we should forgive everybody. He just says we should be appeased. We should allow ourselves to enter into this process of reconciliation with our fellow human beings. And so this is what he's, he's saying God is actually telling us to do about anger. And then he's got a very interesting discussion about the temporality of divine anger. He says, I had said the anger of God is not for a time only, as is the case with a human being who becomes inflamed with an immediate excitement and on account of his frailty is unable easily to govern himself. We should understand that because God is eternal, his anger also remains to eternity. Now, that sounds pretty bad, right? Oh, I've made God angry. Now I'm screwed. God will be angry at me for eternity. God actually, you could say, was already angry at me for being the screw up that I am. But he says, because he is endued with the greatest excellence, he controls his anger and is not ruled by it. He regulates it according to his will, or rather he you know, does as he wills. And then he says, uh, if his anger had been altogether immortal, now here's where he's you know, qualifying this idea of immortality or eternality, there would be no place after a fault for satisfaction or kind feeling, though God commands human beings to be reconciled before the setting of the sun. So there would be a contradiction here. God is saying, hey, you human beings, forgive each other. I'm not going to forgive any of you bastards, though. Well, it doesn't work like that. The anger remains against what it is that people do wrong, but if they change their ways, then they can be forgiven and the divine anger is directed at other things. They no longer fall under the divine anger. He says that it does remain forever against those who ever sin, but... Those who, you know, are going to change their ways, uh, the anger won't be against them, even though there is eternal divine anger. So he says, God is not appeased by incense or a victim or costly offerings. These things are corruptible. What is he appeased by? A, a reformation of morals. He who ceases to sin. Now notice this, this amazing line, renders the anger of God mortal. The one who throws sin away, who, who withdraws from that, who changes their, their character, makes the anger of God no longer eternal, but mortal. With respect to them, right? Not in general, because it's not going to uh, redirect the anger against those who God is justly angry with, the wrongdoers, right? But it actually... Um, does change the situation of the individual in relation to divine anger. So Lactantius is making sense of the fact that God has given, you know, some pretty clear and demanding precepts to human beings about how they ought to deal with their own anger and explain why those precepts given by God don't actually vitiate God's own anger.